Okay, ladies and gents, let's get going then. Um, we had a few gremlins, um, learning a few new things about how Teams Lives work. So thank you for joining us. And today we have the great pleasure of welcoming Renee Boyson uh, to the GeoTalk stage. She is a PhD student at Fitz Geosciences. Um, she joined us um, to do her MSc actually um, at Fitz Geosciences, but before that she as a BSc student at the University of Pretoria. And she's also not only a student at Wits Geosciences, but she's also a guest researcher at the Helmholtz Institute for Research Technology in Freiburg, Germany. And that's where she joins us from, from today. So she's presenting to us from Germany. And as you'll see in this talk, one of her main interests in research is the potential of multi-sensor remote piloted systems and multi-source data integration in mineral exploration. So Renee, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you. And I'm going to ask you to share your screen and to uh, unmute your microphone. OK, can you see? I can see your screen. I'm just going to get your video up very quickly. Okay, and for, for reference today, there are about 35 people in the audience, so even the last minute change in, in link has seemed not to deter people. So Renee, thank you very much, and we can see you and we can see your screen, so over to you. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for having me, Grant. Um, so uh, I think Grant introduced me very well. <laughs> So I don't have, really have more to say, but uh, the work that I've been doing with my uh, PhD is um, a collaboration between WITS and Camira and the Helmholtz Institute here in Freiburg. And I'm uh, excited to share that with you. So for this talk, I uh, kind of section the, the presentation into two parts. The first part, I will cover some basic principles and concepts and uh, technical information that uh, some of you who might be familiar with the topic find a bit redundant, but the, the second part, I will get into an actual practical example and show uh, results that we have gained from the field. And uh, with that, I will start. So I think the best question to start with is uh, why we explore for new mineral deposits. Um, I think with uh, the advancements in technology and then the move towards greener energies, it, uh, there's been a surge in the demand for uh, critical and economically important elements. Uh, elements such as lithium, tin, uh, REEs are now uh, more used than, uh, than in the past. And uh, these uh, elements are specifically typically used in your, your cell phones. You have um, lithium batteries, you have uh, neodymium in these big magnets you find in wind turbines, in your power saving um, light bulbs, you have uh, REEs. So um, with this increased demand, we, uh, we figured we need to uh, have a renewed exploration approach for the deposits. And for that, we, uh, we think we can use uh, remote sensing techniques to do that. And then I guess the question is why why we use remote sensing. So in essential, remote sensing is the study of an object from a distance. In this case, we're studying our environment, the Earth. And um, this is quite beneficial because uh, we can now gain information on areas that uh, we haven't even been to yet. Um, uh, we can now gain information on areas that we can't access and uh, also uh, get data from these areas before we go into the field so that when we do go into the field, we are more prepared. Uh, this only optimizes field activities. Um, your traditional exploration approach uh, typically can be restricted by the field accessibility, like I said, the, the area size, uh, even funding. Um, and if you can gain as much information beforehand, you can just uh, speed up the entire process. But in no means does this mean we can replace the geologist in the field, of course. Uh, the idea is to enhance the, the process of exploration. 
And so I would like to go into what exactly is optical remote sensing. And we'll start from the beginning here. And so firstly, we measure with uh, passive sensors, which means that we use the sun as a source. Uh, in effect, this uh, means that the radiation from the sun uh, would reflect an object and would be either transmitted or emitted or the radiation would be reflected off of this uh, object or material. And we can measure this reflected uh, uh, data information with a passive sensor. Um, and this is quite important because every material on Earth has a very unique spectrum that we can uh, identify the material with, detect it, and then obviously map it. The part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we work in is um, covering from the visible, which is around 450 nanometers, through to the long wave infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, you can see here, I uh, show that we uh, use uh, multi and hyperspectral imaging, which I will explain now. Uh, but I lamented on the fact that we use passive sensors. Uh, this is because, like I said, we use the sun as an energy source. Um, active sensors would um, measure the own, its own energy it sends out, like radar or LIDAR. So it sends out a, an energy source and it measures its return. But here we will focus mostly on uh, passive sensors. And so to delve deeper into the electromagnetic spectrum, um, we have different parts of the spectrum that measures uh, different types of radiation. So the visible to shortwave infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum measures the reflected spectrum off of an object, whereas your long wave infrared measures the emittance. Uh, this is important because certain minerals um, have distinct spectral features in different parts of the spectrum. Uh, here I go into that. Um, so minerals containing carbonates, water and uh, hydroxyls uh, usually produce absorption features or uh, distinguish distinguishable spectral features in the uh, shortwave infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and this is caused by the vibrational overtones of molecules asso and associated uh, cations. Then, when you look at your um, visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, different uh, electronic processes that occur in your transition metals, such as your um, uh, Fe2 plus or Fe3 plus, um, as well as your trivalent REEs, um, causes absorption features in your visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, this is important because if you know the types of bonds you have in your mineral, you can uh, beforehand kind of assume where you would find distinguished features. And here I uh, show you three. So in the, the visible part of the, um, the veneer part of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, we can distinguish neodymium, which is a key pathfinder for REEs. It has these typical three absorption features around 580, 740 and 800 nanometers. And whereas in the short wave infrared, the SWIR part of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, you would, can distinguish different carbonates. Uh, there, depending on your uh, carbonate bond, whether you have a calcium carbo carbonate or a magnesium carbonate, so dolomite or calcite, depends, um, you can distinguish that by depending on which, where exactly that absorption feature is situated. And then uh, the long wave infrared part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is a tricky part for me personally, um, you can identify your feldspars uh, as well as your quartz in this part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So quartz has this typical M shape, which is uh, nicely depicted here. Uh, with spectroscopy, you can measure uh, different types of minerals with a handheld spectrometer like my colleague Louis here is using. Um, it measures a point spectrum and then you would get a spectra like this. I'll go into detail with that a bit later as well. Um, then from spectral points, we would move to spectral imaging. So spectral imaging is where you would image from a certain platform, either a satellite depicted here or a plane or a drone, and you would capture a data cube, either a hyperspectral or a multispectral data cube. Uh, this means that each pixel of your image 
contains a spectrum uh, and that spectrum is dependent on what or where you measured in your wavelengths. So a hyperspectral data cube has adjacent narrow um, spectral bands, we call them bands, um, creating this nice smooth, or not smooth, but let's say just this nice continuous, that's the word, spectrum you see at the top right corner. Uh, compare that to your multi-spectrum spectral data. You have broader bands, not necessarily um, adjacent or adjacent to one another and not necessarily contingent. So you might have gaps in your band, which um, as you can see, your, your spectra would be much more coarse. Um, here, comparing the two, you see the general shape is similar, but uh, for example, if you look between the blue and the, the green part of the spectrum, you have a little dip there, which uh, is not imaged by your multispectral. So this is why working in hyperspectral is quite nice because you can find these very small absorption features. And then moving towards the, the type of approach we take for mineral exploration, and this is a, a multi-scale, multi-source approach. Uh, and this is the approach that I've been focusing on in my PhD. Um, the idea behind this is to look at data from various scales uh, on various platforms. So using satellite data, we can map the regional geology, um, which covers a large area. Uh, from there, we can delineate areas of interest and uh, map it with plane based data with a higher spatial and spectral resolution uh, if uh, we use hyperspectral in this case. And um, once we do that, we can really detect the targets we want to focus on in the field and then go into the field with our drones and uh, be able to survey with a much higher spatial resolution. And here you can clearly see the, the difference in spatial resolution when it comes to plane versus um, drone based data. The plane based data you can you only see pixels but with the drones you can actually see the different dikes that we want to investigate. Um, so yeah so the equipment that we use in the field we have two types of drones we have a copter or copters and we have fixed wing drones. The copters are generally heavier but they can carry a heavier load. Um, but because of that, they only have about a flight time between anything between 15 to 30 minutes max. Uh, but the, the sensors they can carry are the heavier sensors, such as LIDAR, uh, you can carry hyperspectral sensors, um, as well as magnetics. So it's, it's really nice to have a, a copter to carry these heavier sensors. Then we also use the SenseFly EB, which is a fixed wing. Now these uh, drones are very, very light. Um, which means they can fly a lot longer and this time and this it means like a, around an hour uh, but they can't carry that heavy sensors so we mo mo mostly use them for photogrammetry purposes so they carry an RGB camera and then take uh, photos for photogrammetry. Uh, the sensors which we use in the field uh, we have quite a, a variety and uh, the one sensor that goes onto the drone uh, at, at the moment is called the Ricola it captures in the veneer part of the spectrum. And uh, it is a full frame camera, so it takes one frame at a time. Uh, some of our ground based sensors, we have the Spec FX10 and 17, they capture in the sh veneer and you know, the visible and the near infrared part of the spectrum just before the, mm, yeah, so a little bit in the sewer as well. And these cameras we usually use in the field for outcrop sensing. So you would put them on a tripod and then you can um, scan and outcrop with them. Uh, they are also quite lightweight though, but, um, but still at the moment a little bit too heavy for the drones I showed you, but with uh, better drones you can put them on a, on a drone. Um, then we also have the Specchem Phoenix, which is without a doubt my favorite sensor. It covers the, the visible near infrared all the way to 2500 nanometers, so short wave as well. It's a push broom, also a line scanner, so it scans. Uh, this, you can see there's a picture of it in the field, so we can put it on a tripod and 
uh, image um, a wall or an outcrop, a mine face. Uh, this sensor can also be used in a drill core scanner, uh, which is where you would put in your drill cores and scan the surface of your drill cores to do mineral mapping, check your uh, core logging. And then lastly, we have the Telops Hypercam, which is um, a frame-based or full-frame camera, and it uh, images in the long-wave infrared part of the spectrum. This, as well, you can see it's in the photo on a tripod. You can put it in the field or in the lab. Um, so with that, we also have to validate, which I think is one of the most important parts. We, the, the equipment that we use to validate our hyperspectral uh, data with, uh, we use a spectral evolution handheld spectrometer. Uh, as you can see, it's the, the image in the middle. The spectrometer has a, has a contact probe and it takes a point spectra of your sample. You can use this either in the field or in the lab. And it, uh, it covers the, the veneer all the way to the sewer part of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is great. Uh, we also have an FTIR, which covers the long wave part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And then we have the portable XRF to give us the, the elemental composition of the rock that we are studying. So once you've captured the data, you would have to correct them. And here I'm focusing on the drone-borne data corrections. Um, so I, I, I focused on the part where, you know, what type of sensor is which. And, and this comes into play when you have to correct your data. So if you have a line scanner on a drone and the drone is moving and vibrating as you scan, each line that's being uh, taken is not necessarily um, at the same position as the next one. So you have your lines like that creating this wave effect you can see in the image there. And you need to correct that, of course. Uh, when you have a frame-based camera, you take one frame at a time. But uh, you, it takes about a second, maybe a second and a half to take one image. And it takes each uh, band uh, on its own which means that every time you vibrate like this, your different bands are at a little bit of a different position, creating this mismatch between your bands. And you also have to correct that. You will see, I will go into detail a bit about that later when it comes to the actual example. And then of course, lastly, we need to geometrically validate our airborne data. And with this, we do, uh, we use GCPs, ground control points. It's a point where you know the exact coordinate. So when you take an image, you know that that specific pixel has that specific coordinate. We also use ground-based LiDAR. To go into detail with the pre-processing steps, and the reason I, I focus on this is because when it comes to your remote sensing data, one of the important parts is to correct the data for a robust, reliable, and trustworthy data sets which you can use to map your, um, your rocks with your whatever you want to do with it. And so when it comes to your plane-based and satellite data, uh, most of the methods are quite established and standardized. Um, you would do your radiometric calibrations, georeferencing, topographic corrections, and then you would do otis, ot atmospheric corrections. Um, the, um, these methods are all established. You can even download satellite data that has have already corrected all of as have have been already corrected um, next when it comes to your your drone based hyperspectral data uh, to correct for that there's no standardized method for that yet and uh, my brilliant colleague sandra has developed a toolbox to correct for drone based data and what we do here is we use the um, the eb for uh, to capture images for structure from motion photogrammetry, and it produces your ortho mosaics and your digital elevation models or digital surface models. And then in turn, those models are used to correct the hyperspectral drone-borne data or the ground-based hyperspectral data. Your, when it comes to your drone-based hyperspectral data, when we um, correct the spectra, we use ground panels, which you will see in the example I will show. Uh, these panels we know the spectra of, so we can use that to calibrate our image with. We then do your co-registration of your bands, like I talked about. 
we do automatic georeferencing, topographic corrections, and then we mosaic the images together as it takes one image at a time. Uh, the one thing here, the one big difference between your corrections of your drones and your ground and, and your uh, satellite data is the fact that satellite data requires atmospheric corrections. Uh, you have quite a lot of atmosphere between your satellite and the ground, whereas when you fly a drone, you're only about between 20 and 60 meters. Or, well, it depends on which drone, but for hyperspectral drone board data, you're between 20 and 60 meters off of the ground, which uh, doesn't necessarily require atmospheric corrections. So to get to the actual analysis of the data and the methods that we use to uh, analyze what we see. Um, one of my favorite methods, it's a very straightforward method, easy, easily to understand, <laughs> is the minimum wavelength mapping method. You directly go pixel by pixel and you map the position and depth of an absorption feature. So if you know you, you're you working with, I don't know, micas, you, can, you know where the absorption feature should be and then you map the position of that throughout your entire scene. Uh, another method is uh, simple band ratios, where it's a spectral band ratios of your specific wavelengths. So if you have an absorption feature here, like um, the example I show is a, a carbonate absorption feature, you pretty much just take the, the one wavelength divided by the other one. This will enhance the absorption features throughout the entire uh, image. Uh, other methods that uh, I, we use typically, are um, spectral similarity methods, such as spectral angle mapper or spectral information divergence. Um, this is where you, uh, where the spectra is converted to a point vector in n-dimensional space, n being the amount of bands. Here we only depict two bands, so two dimensions. So when you have your uh, reference, your, your, your spectral point, your pixel, you can have a, you compare that to a reference point and you, the smaller the angle between the two points, the more similar the spectra is. So ideally you want an angle of zero and then your spectra will be very, very similar. And so you can map this using um, similarities. So uh, the next method is also, um, it's a port vector machine. It's a supervised learning algorithm. Uh, basically you have a training data set and it learns as it goes. Um, it's an optimal binary classification uh, using a hyperplane. So it's basically a yes or no, like you either have the specific um, type of rock that you want or you're not, or you don't, sorry. And with that, I would like to get to the actual example where we uh, applied our multi-spectral, multi-scale approach. And this is uh, Marinka Scuela Carbonatite Alkaline Carbonatite Complex. It's in uh, no, southern Namibia, right at the border between Namibia and South Africa. And uh, it forms part of the Kabuas Bremen Igneous Province. Uh, it consists of your, you know, your granites, your cyanides, and your carbonatites. And what's great about this um, uh, complex is that it contains all three types of carbonatites that we can um, study and use our techniques on. And, uh, so you have the calcium, magnesium, and ferro. And the reason why we look at this is because your carbonatites is the main deposit for REEs. So if you want to explore for REEs, you want to look at carbonatites. And so this is, you can see in the geological map, the, the general structure of the, the, com the carbonatites is a circular intrusion with this eastern limb, northeastern limb going like that. And so first we looked at it or studied it with uh, satellite data, specifically using Sentinel-2 data. Uh, Sentinel is uh, it's a multispectral satellite data and uh, it has a really good ground resolution of 10 to 60 meters, as you can see the specs there. The, um, the, it covers quite a large area of extent, like you see in the satellite image, um, which is great for us. So we downloaded quite a few uh, Sentinel data sets, and we use that to try and identify carbonatite bodies 
using support vector machine in that uh, in southern Africa. And we had a little bit of an idea where we can expect uh, carbonatite bodies, because uh, here I show a map from Thurvut 1993, where you have carbon known carbonatite bodies with throughout southern Africa. And with this method, we were able to accurately identify uh, carbonatite bodies such as Dickervillum, Teofelskuppen, Mickberg, Sandkorpsdrift, as well as Marinka Squalen. And uh, what's quite amazing for me about this is the extent of the, the satellite scene is huge. And for it to have accurately identified, mapped uh, Marinka Squalen and the general shape of it is um, quite amazing. Then after that, we of course want to study it in a little bit more higher resolution. And so we used high map data, uh, specifically oh, so high map data. So this is hyperspectral plane based data. It has a spectral, um, it covers the spectral range from the veneer to the sewer. And the, the spatial resolution is 4.5. So it's, it's quite a big uh, resolution gap from going from your satellite to your high map, as you can see in the image I'm depicting here. So you, you see the body quite nicely in the, the false color composite that I'm showing. And so again, I used um, SVM to map the different carbonatite types uh, with a higher spatial resolution. And um, oh, it was really great because we were able to really see the, the magnesium carbonatite in red, the, you know, the circular intrusion and the eastern limb there, and uh, map the calcium carbonatite. But I would like to draw your attention to this part of the geological map, which is supposed to be calcium carbonatite. And when we did this method, um, we didn't really find calcium carbonatite there. And this was quite interesting because when we went into the field, we confirmed that uh, there is not really that much calcium carbonatite, it's actually mainly cyanite. So we were able to go into the field with this information, uh, have better information and improve the existing geological map, which really directed where we want to focus in the field. And um, combining that with your topographic uh, data, really shows you that, that uh, for example, that eastern limb is not really just a little outcrop, it's an entire mountain range. So it gives you perspective on where it is located, everything. And then, of course, after that, getting all of this information, we went into the field with our UAVs and our, our ground scanners. And uh, Marinka Escuela is um, characterized by quite rough terrain. Um, so it was a it was a bit difficult getting into it. It's only about seven kilometers from the main road, but it is, um, there's not really a road. So it takes about two hours to get to the actual body and then set up camp and everything. But uh, it, it's quite amazing when you're there and you see with this uh, little, or this photo I showed you, the, the dark brown rocks or the carbonatite outcrops. And it's quite amazing when to be there, but I can see why it's difficult to be able to accurately map that on foot. And so also going into the field with the equipment, you also have to take the equipment into the field, which is not always easy. Uh, even though you can now access areas that you can't access on foot, you still have to get the equipment there. And then you can see my colleague Robert there on the top left, carrying the silver box. The, the ba that box contains the drone the Thorleg specifically. Uh, we can't put the Thorleg in our backpacks because the, the, the legs would snap. So he, he had this special carrier for his back to put the, the drone on. So that was quite tough, but definitely worth it. And then I'd like to just show a quick video on how some of these drones fly, um, maybe for those who aren't um, very familiar with it. So here we'll see the beginning of the flight with the Tholeg. So back there you see Junite, he's our other drone pilot. And it can be flown automatically or manually. We fly it mainly manually. It's uh, the same with the um, Aobotics, this orange drone. We also fly this mainly manually. 
covers a large area and this is the fixed wing and you have to push it to uh, get it to take off. Uh, the data that we get from this is really high resolution, very detailed data, which is what we want. So with that being said, I'll show you now actual results from Marinka Escuela. Uh, so first, like I mentioned, we used the, the EB, we would fly, we would um, take photos as the EB fly. The photos have to have 80% overlap for the photogrammetry so that you can produce a 3D model, your ortho mosaic and your digital elevation model. And um, you can see the, the resolution now is even much higher than the the plane based hyperspectral. The plane based, like I said, was 4.5 meter ground resolution. This is um, originally about 14 centimeter resolution. I resampled here to 30 meters. Um, but here you can really nicely see the carbonatites. You can see the darker color of the carbonatite outcrops and um, which is what we want to investigate of course you can see the contact there the top between the magnesio and calcite carbonatite and then uh, you can see the entire extent of the area that needs to be covered on foot if you would do all of this on foot which would be challenging And here I'd like to uh, end it off with the, the spot that we located to perform the hyperspectral drone borne survey on. It's a, it's a small spot right next to this uh, ridge containing carb calcium carbonatite. And with that, we used, like I mentioned earlier, um, the Ricola imager on the Tholeg. And we would capture data along that small outcrop there next to the ridge you see in the bottom corner the when you capture the data ever like i mentioned the the drone vibrates as you capture data and each band is captured separately so you would capture your first band it would vibrate the next band it would vibrate and then the next band so you end up with this data set that the bands are not exactly on top of each other and the way we correct for this is we have to co-register the bands and with that, we use a key point detection and matching algorithm where key points are detected and then matched together, stacked together, so that you end up with a corrected data set. Then this is merged with your topographic data that we have from the EV to, uh, to, uh, to also rectify and uh, georeference the, the drone borne hyperspectral data. Uh, after this, we, we stack all the, we stitch all the images together to form a complete mosaic uh, like this. Uh, here I show the mosaic and then of course the points where we would sample along the outcrop to uh, validate our spectral data. And with that, we, I try to map the REEs from the hyperspectral image. Now, as I mentioned, uh, we we typically look for neodymium, which is, as you can see here, at 580, 740, and 800 nanometers. And I would use minimum wavelength mapping to map these positions. And in my bottom right uh, corner image, uh, I map just that. So where you see the red is where you, uh, I've mapped the REEs in the outcrop. And this is what the spectra looks like. So with drone-borne spectra, it's of course a lot more noisier with the vibrations of the drone and the noise in the, at, um, in the environment, you introduce noise into your signal. But uh, noise is random, whereas an absorption feature would be consistent throughout. So, and we were able to uh, find absorption features of neodymium and compare that with the ground-based um, spectral measurements. And then, for that, we went, we took spectral measurements, took the coordinates of these measurements as well. And you can see 
um, at point one, three and five, the small absorption features are present in your handheld spectrometer measurement. Uh, of course, after that, we would sample those points. Uh, we did sample those points and the uh, ICPMS results came back and uh, it had elevated amounts of neodymium, which is great. Um, point number seven, you can see it at very low amounts of neodymium and it did not pick up in the spectra at all. So that's good. So you have a you have a negative. Um, not negative, but uh, you have a you basically don't have absorption features in that spectra. You don't see it in your rock, which verifies your findings. And then we also used ground based scanning, like I mentioned. Um, here we, we replace the, the Phoenix, which goes from the, the veneer to the sewer uh, on the tripod, and we scanned the main intrusion, the, the main circular intrusion, to see if we can distinguish between the different carbonatites uh, in a very high resolution. Now, um, by looking at the spectra, um, it looks also noisy, as you can see, but it, it's still very promising because you see typically absorption features at 2330 nanometers. And the area that we scanned, if you look at the geological map, contains both magnesium and calcium, which essentially we can differentiate. So you would see the calcium is uh, located more to the uh, longer wavelengths, whereas your magnesium has a uh, absorption feature more to the, the shorter wavelength. And the, the difference is only 10 nanometer difference. But with the, the high spec, spe, spectral resolution, uh, we can distinguish between the magnesium and calcium. And then to conclude, and I hope I wasn't too fast, um, the the multi-scale and multi-source approach uh, for mineral exploration is there to help the, the field geologist to Im improve the process itself, to gain as much information before you go into the field, um, to really make sure that you find your targets you want to investigate. Um, we also uh, find that it improves the existing geological maps. And then also integrating your spectral and topographic information is imperative to you when, when you do exploration. And so for the next step, uh, we want to incorporate um, UAV based sewer data. And it is now possible because there's two companies who have a, a drone borne sewer camera or two that I know of. I'm sure there's others, but two big ones. The, um, you have your high specs and your head wall. But for, uh, sewer cameras for our drones and uh, to incorporate that information into the entire process would be magnificent and as well as using not just your spectral information but looking at your radar as well and with that i'd like to conclude my talk and i hope it was good and interesting renee thank you that uh, talk was absolutely fantastic really really interesting and i think uh, Judging by the audience that uh, that made it through, despite the gremlins, over 60 people, uh, I'm sure they all really enjoyed it out there. So thank you for that. Much appreciated.